page 505. Esther chapter 7 is where we have reached. And you may remember that um, Esther has invited King Xerxes and his prime minister, as it were, Haman, to two banquets. So the first one on day one, we're about to hear about the second one on day two. Uh, in the meantime, um, Haman is very upset with Mordecai and has set up an enormous great pole on which he plans to impale Mordecai outside his house. Uh, but in fact, what happens is that the king suddenly is pleased with Mordecai and Haman has to lead Mordecai through the streets of the town uh, in the king's robes and announce to the whole world, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. So Haman is not very pleased. Nonetheless, the banquet is about to come. So we're at uh, Esther chapter seven. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. And as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he, the man who has dared to do such a thing? Esther said, an adversary and enemy, this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banqueting hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, a pole reaching to a height of 50 cubits stands by Haman's house. He had it set up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And it was page 505 for Esther chapter 7. It would probably be uh, good to have that open. Let's pray for God's help. Lord, we marvel at this book of Esther, which has no mention of the word of God or of your name in it. And yet, and yet, we read your action and your power and your beauty and your sovereign working in every line, just as we do, Lord, in our lives too. And we, we marvel at uh, all that you work and do day by day uh, in us and for us. Help us now to hear your word through these words of the scriptures, this word which your spirit has inspired and given us, which has stood the test of centuries and speak still freshly to us today. Lord, uh, help us to uh, have ears to hear for your name's sake. Amen. Well, I wonder if you would rather watch a romantic comedy or a horror film. I used to have a very strong preference for one of those over the other. 
I now quite like both. Maybe that's Becky's influence. <laughs> Often in a romantic comedy, obstacles are overcome in an amusing way for a happy ending in which A and B get together and live happily ever after. Really, I ought to write for Hollywood, oughtn't I? In a horror film, the gruesome and cruel nature of life and humanity is often displayed at its worst. The cliffhanging moments are truly life or death. And the resolution of the story often involves a comeuppance of truly horrific proportions. And I think we should be honest and say both of those reflect aspects of real life. In the rom-com, you watch Sleepless in Seattle, there's a good example. Those who have life stacked against them end up blessed. In a horror film, like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Those who exert cruel and bloodthirsty power over their victims become the victims of a horrendous end. You could say that those who humble themselves will be exalted, while those who exalt themselves are humbled. Well, we might find ourselves uh, quite comfortable with a plot uh, such as we have here, that, that sets some poor exiled Jews in a sticky situation of great threat, and then we see God working behind the scenes to save them. Great. But that's only ever half the reality. The other half is the story of a vicious monster called Haman, who wants to assassinate millions of Jews and impale Mordecai on a 50-foot pole. It's not 50-foot, is it? What is it? It's even bigger than that, I think. His intentions are dark, black, and vile. And his end in chapter 7 is public, humiliating, agonizing, bloody, and horrific. Do you like that part of the story as well? We'll come back to that thought. Now, um, Esther chapters 1, 2, and 3 covers about nine years. I don't know if you followed that one. Uh, we points it out through at various points in the story. Nine years to set up the heart of the story, which happens over these two days, with Esther holding a banquet for the king and for Haman on both of those days. So chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8 happen on two days. You see how the writer has slowed right down the time and the writing to emphasize the central nature of these events. Nine years of preparation leading to two days. On day one, Esther held her first banquet Haman uh, is angered by Mordecai refusing to show him what Haman thinks is the proper respect. So he sets up this great tall pole and he plans to impale Mordecai on it. But the next morning, Haman goes to court and the king asks him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Well, Haman assumes the king means him. So he comes up with a delightful little ceremony that he himself would enormously enjoy. But the king then tells Haman to enact this ceremony for Mordecai, not for Haman himself. In fact, Haman has to lead Mordecai through the town, shouting out to the world, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Well, it's the same day, and now it's towards evening. And time for day two's banquet as chapter 7 begins verse 1 so the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet and as they were drinking wine on the second day the king again asked as he did on day one Queen Esther what is your petition it will be given you what is your request even up to half the kingdom it'll be granted well it's clear isn't it Esther has won the king's favor 
Even the writer now is regularly referring to her as Queen Esther, emphasizing her royalty and her oneness with the king, her position of privilege under the king's favor. Esther has acted with extreme diplomatic skill, not pushing too hard and too fast, only explaining herself now at the second banquet, gaining the king's favor through food. Well, always the way to a man's heart, isn't it? And now, in her speech of verses 3 and 4, she uses his own phrase, your petition, your request, and pleads, grant me my life, this is my petition, and spare my people, this is my request. Now, do you notice that also the word sold in verse 4, which will remind the king of Haman's offer of money back in chapter 3, verse 9, uh, when Haman offered almost like a bribe to the king to let him issue this murderous edict for the annihilation of the Jews. And she reminds him also of the very wording of the edict, using the triple phrase, destroyed, killed, and annihilated. I mean, when you've done one of those, you don't need to do the other two, do you? But it's three times over because that's what the edict said in chapter 3, verse 13, exactly those verbs. And she makes the nice point that if it were just slavery, she wouldn't be bothering his majesty. But since it's actually destruction, perhaps the king will understand why she thinks that's a big enough deal for it to come to his attention. Now, of course, in doing this, she is nailing her colors to the mast and coming out in solidarity with her own people, who are, of course, God's people. Isn't she wise? Don't you admire her tactful approach and her courage and yet the directness in that request? Grant me my life, spare my people. And of course the king is appalled. Who is he? Where is he, the man who has dared to do such a thing? Well, he hasn't actually got very far to look, has he? It's, uh, there's only three of them at the banquet and it's not him. And it's not Esther. It is a bit like a pantomime, isn't it? He's behind you. <laughs> and Esther says it in short, stark phrases. An adversary, an enemy, this vile Haman. Now, this is a bit of a tricky moment. Tricky all round. First of all, of course, very tricky for Haman. Wouldn't want to be him, would you? He has seen that the king is clearly on Esther's side, you know, even up to half my kingdom. And she has denounced him as a vicious genocidal traitor. He's caught red-handed, he's caught red-faced, and he's quite right. He can only see one outcome. What's he going to do? Is he going to run for his life? Will he follow the king, plead with the king? No, he opts instead for begging for mercy from the queen even though actually, of course, no man ought to be left indoors with another man's wife. The king's gone out, hasn't he? Now, it's a tricky moment also for the king. After all, this decree to kill the Jews has gone out to his entire empire. Under his own signet ring, from his prime minister, with his approval. Ah. In a nutshell, the king suddenly realizes he's trusted the wrong man and he himself is going to look very foolish, uh, inconsistent or something worse. And, and he's in a rage. Well, not surprising. He's furious about it. He doesn't know what to do. Well, when you don't know what to do, it's best to go out in the garden. So that's what he's gone. Uh, he, goes, he storms out into his palace garden. And verse 8 says, just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banqueting hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. Oh, look, 
It's another of those little coincidences, isn't it? Just as this was something else happened, just at that right moment, somebody did something. And those are the little, the little coincidences that make up the lives and history of God's people. The king enters just as Haman is pleading with the queen for his life, falling before her, falling, it looks, almost on top of her in a way that to the king seems exceedingly inappropriate. Will he molest my queen under my own roof? Well, actually, this now does offer the king a good way to deal with Haman and put all the emphasis on his conduct rather than on the king's own foolishness. And up pipes the king's attendant, this eunuch, Harbona. I like his little part in the story. Uh, oh, by the way of nothing, your majesty, do you uh, happen also to know that Haman, whom you've just caught molesting your wife, has set up a pole outside his own house, a very big pole, on which to um, impale Mordecai. Oh yes, that Mordecai who actually saved your majesty's life by foiling a plot against you. Well, you can imagine Haman's expression. And we have to imagine it because he's got his head in a bag by this time. But thank you, Harbona. That was just the information that the king needed. And the king takes the hint, impale Haman on that pole. So they impale Haman on the pole that he'd set up for Mordecai and the king's fury subsided. Now, I'm sure you'd like to know a little bit more about impaling. <laughs> it's been done in different ways throughout history and by different rulers and regimes, even, actually, would you believe it, in the 20th century, in the Armenian genocide in and after the First World War. But the earliest accounts... Uh, of impaling come from the ancient Near East, exactly this territory, from Babylon, Assyria, Egypt, and yes, Persia. The Greek historian Herodotus says that Persian king Darius, when he conquered the Babylonians, impaled 3,000 of them on poles. There's an inscription we have uh, written by Darius in the first person, uh, speaking of his pride in impaling 49 rebels all at one time. Um, and I've got a couple of pictures for you, just what you wanted on a Sunday evening. Um, and uh, Matthew's going to put those up for us. So the first one, please, in the British Museum. Um, here you can see uh, impaling um, in a, an Assyrian frieze taken from Nineveh. Uh, and you can see three Jewish people from the uh, Israelite city of Lachish being impaled. Um, they're the three guys at the top uh, by two um, uh, Assyrian soldiers at the bottom. Can you make it out? Poor three guys at the top, stuck on the top of poles. Um, and uh, I've got a, a second one. There, that one uh, comes from Nimrud. Again, um, that's, it's, it's all this same territory doesn't look comfortable, does it? Now, it's, it is possible that the word for impaling in Esther actually means hanging, by, as in by the neck, but clearly impaling was known and practiced in that part of the world. It's horrific. But I did warn you to expect some blood and horror tonight. Well, let's learn. Um, uh, thanks, Matthew. Yeah, I think that'll do for that. <laughs> let's learn some lessons that all begin with R. I'll put them on the sheet. So the first is reversal. God delights in reversing situations. With God, Israelite slaves are set free while Egyptian pursuers get drowned. The youngest and most overlooked little shepherd boy from the least of the tribes becomes the greatest king. And on the sheet here I've put um, at the top, you know, Haman plans death for Mordecai and honor for Haman. 
But what does God plan? He plans honor for Mordecai and death for Haman. Total reversal, isn't it? You can't miss it. It's the heart of the story of Esther. And think of the Gospels. Jesus, the homeless, penniless, compassionate preacher is pursued and persecuted and arrested on trumped-up charges and put to death. Yeah, put to death. Actually, uh, one of our songs that we sometimes sing at this e these evening services says this, There is a life so true, a life of love so pure, for all our sin, a perfect sacrifice. And then that life was nailed on cruel cross, impaled. Yeah. Now, Mordecai avoided the impaling that was intended for him. Jesus did not. He went through it. He was impaled on a cruel cross all the way to death. And still God can reverse things, even in a tomb. Jesus, who made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, humbled himself, became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. And here's the reversal. Therefore, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above every name. And if your life involves suffering, discomfort, bad turns of events, opposition to your Christian witness, loneliness, misery, pain, and sacrifice. Don't forget that the way of God is to reverse it. He reverses it. He promises it. Truly, I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel, and everyone, and everyone, says Jesus, who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Our little lives look pathetic to the world. Committed Christianity is not esteemed in our society. But God is the God of reversals. Isn't that good news? Second, retribution. Ooh. That's a bit of a word, isn't it? That sounds a bit horrible, but vengeful. In fact, the word just means repayment. And Haman sure gets his repayment, doesn't he? Exactly what he planned for Mordecai is what he himself receives. Now, God is not vengeful in the way that human beings can be. Haman, of course, is a, a great example of human vengefulness. It has no justification. It's aroused by personal affront. It's stirred by sins of pride and anger and self-centeredness. It's unprincipled and it frequently overstepping the seriousness of the original wrong. That's Haman all over, isn't it? God's retribution is fair and logical and just. There must be punishment for sin. Otherwise, the world will simply prove to be unfair and we'll find Hitler and Pol Pot sipping cocktails on a, you know, by a beach in heaven. It's unthinkable that God should allow it. How are there victims in this life supposed to cope with that? You know, and if crimes don't matter, if sins don't matter, well, then we might as well go and enjoy doing some. No, that's not the world God has, has set up. There is justice. 
as Jesus' mother says, God lifts up the humble, but he also scatters the proud and brings down the powerful. God fights against the wicked. Now, I'm sure, I'm not sure whether we're supposed to enjoy the impaling of Haman. It's almost an enjoyment, isn't it? I think we're supposed to find it satisfying. Like God, we should desire all to repent and find forgiveness, but the impenitent will meet retribution from God. And rightly so. They have fought against him without remorse. Retribution means he will fight against them. I wonder who will win. Well, Satan found out who would win, didn't he? He entered into Judas. Luke 22, verse 3. Satan entered Judas in order to have Jesus put to death. But Jesus ends up alive forever. And Judas ends up dead. Luke says he bought a field, fell headlong in it, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Satan did not win, does not win, and will not win. And that's good news too, isn't it? In Revelation, the lamb sits on the throne and the beast is thrown into the lake of fire. That's the retribution that we should all love and long for. And my third R is relief. Mordecai's been under threat. Now he is saved. Esther's situation has been hidden, dangerous, on a knife edge. Now it's in the open, and she has the king's favor. And for the Jews... Well, you'll have to wait a little further. For all God's people of every age, we find in God relief. Those who oppose us, he will oppose, and he will lift up our heads. Uh, we should note this is not the end of the story yet. And uh, we've, lo- we've read chapter 7 today. Chapter 8, verse 8 will remind us that no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring, can be revoked. So that edict concerning concerning the slaughter of the Jews still stands, cannot be repealed. Oh dear, we'll have to leave that for next time. But God has at least begun the process of bringing relief to his people. And finally, let's not fail to notice the reign of God. He reigns, he reigns over this book, through this book, under this book. And he reigns over the little things. Just at the right moment, the king returns from the garden as Haman falls on Queen Esther. But in the big picture, it means that he will not fail to destroy the enemies and bring us to himself in safety and reward and love. Who's in charge of the kingdom? Not Haman. Not Satan. Not secularism. Not the latest ideology, idea, or idol. But Jesus. And that is good news. He is the one to serve. He is the one to honor. And indeed to love. And so you see the Bible story. Preparing for millennia racing through centuries, slows down and slows and slows to its center point. 30 years, three years, three hours on a cross. And there is the center, there is the point, there is the great reversal. And there is the downfall of evil and the triumph of God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you and marvel at your hold on history.
We thank you that you delight in these reversals, lifting up those who look to you in their great and desperate need. And yes, Lord, we delight also in that prospect of the bringing down of evil, of the bringing down of enemies, the defeat of wrong. Lord Jesus, you went to the cross so that you might rise to the throne. Teach us, Lord, to carry our crosses in the here and now and to cling to your promise that those who humble themselves will be exalted. Amen.